Hey, what's up, podcast listeners? My name is Jessica. I am your host here on What Happens in the Woods. And along with me, as always, is my partner in true crime, my husband, Bryce. Hello. Hello. Um, so we're just going to try to provide a little entertainment during this weird, safer at home environment we're all in. How's everybody doing? How do you think we're doing, Bryce? I think we're doing fine. Yeah, we're not we're not too crazy at this no. point. Any more than normal? Any more than normal, no. Yeah, it's, it's getting a little wild. Four dogs, two kids. I don't know. We hope everybody's safe and healthy, and, and if you can stay at home, that's great. So I... Just weird times. Definitely. Yeah. I feel like I thought I was going to be so productive, <laughs> and I'm not. I have. Plans. I had such big plans. I thought we were just going to, I actually was like afraid that we were going to f- not have things to do. Yeah. And that's not <laughs> been the issue at all. Mm-mm. Yeah. So, well, all right. Enough chit chat. We are here to discuss crime and murders and crazy shit. So are you ready? Uh, let me put my seatbelt on. Hold on. I'm ready. Okay. All right. So before I go into too much detail, let me tell you how I heard about this case. Okay. So the last episode I mentioned that after we had moved from California, I was unpacking and I was watching TV and that's how I found the disappearance of Susan Powell. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Literally right after that, I started watching another documentary or docuseries on Mm -hmm. Netflix called The Confession Tapes. Because what else is there to do in quarantine? Well, I wasn't in quarantine. This is when I moved here. Oh. Like, this is when we moved here. All right. Yeah. So, you know, I was just kind of thinking, okay, I I watched Susan Powell. That was kind of depressing. And I'm thinking, okay, but I still want to watch something true crime related. So let me just find something else. Okay. So I found this series. And right off the bat, the first two episodes are on this murder that we're going to discuss. And I just kind of had this epiphany of this just confirms that we moved to murder fucking central. Yeah. We're, we're pretty yeah. much. <clears throat> I mean, I, before we had moved here, I've never heard so much of Washington state crime. And since then it's just everywhere without yeah. me even trying to find it. Yes. I feel like. So anyways, naturally I watched both episodes of about this case and I was just immediately had to know more and started Googling. So this week we are going to take a look at a murder that happened in Bellevue, Washington, uh, just right up the road from us. Not too far. Yeah. In 1994. So just a little teeny background on Bellevue. It's just outside of Seattle And it's pretty affluent. So it's, you know, nice family homes, pretty much what you would expect, like a established suburban area to be outside of a major city. Um, Really doesn't have much crime. And crimes of this nature are just completely unheard of. So the crime I'm talking about is the Raffae family murders. All right. All right. Dr. Tariq Raffae and his wife, Sultana and their daughter, Basma, Mm -hmm. were found bloody and bludgeoned in their home in the early morning of July 13th, 1994. Police uh, were pretty quick to suspect Atif Rafay, the doctor's son, Mm -hmm. and his longtime friend, Sebastian Burns, of the crime. So eventually the two are arrested and convicted on three counts each of first degree murder. So you think... Well, they're convicted. It's open and shut, right? Yeah. Yeah, you couldn't be more wrong. Um, Researching this case just left me scratching my head. And I was questioning a lot of stuff. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Here's a little information on everybody involved. So Dr. Raffae Mm -hmm. is a structural engineer who was offered a job in Washington after... The firm that he worked for in Vancouver, British Columbia, had downsized. Okay. So at one point, he was also a director for something called the Canada-Pakistan Friendship Organization. And that's an organization that helps to build bridges Mm and understanding between the Pakistani community and the Canadian population. Okay. 
And then his wife, Sultana, was a nutritionist and a homemaker. Um, both of them were very well respected, seemingly, and liked in their communities. And they had two children. Um, their oldest was their daughter, who was 20, and then their son, who was 18. And Basma still lived at home. She um, had a diagnosis of autism and was nonverbal. So she, you know, that's challenging. You're not going to be able to necessarily live on your own with that. Yeah. So she still lived at home with her parents. Atif, uh, who was one of the suspects, very bright student, very gifted. And um, he was at that time a freshman at Cornell University in New York. Oh, wow. Look at the big brain on him. Right. Um, so to, you know, outside world, they look like just your happy, very happy, normal family. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the other suspect um, involved in this is Sebastian Burns, who was also 18. Mm-hmm. He is a Atif's, one of his really good, uh, like, can't separate them type of friends. Yeah. They went to school together in Vancouver. Uh, British Columbia, not not Washington. Um, they were both very smart. So he was also very intellectual, and he was into a lot of extracurricular activities at school. And pretty much all of the accounts of his family in life mm-hmm. suggest that he also had a very happy childhood and home. All right. So now that we know who's involved, we're going to talk about what happened the night of the crime. All right. So when the murders take place, Atif and Sebastian have been visiting the family while Atif was on break from school. So they had been there for about a week. All right. Okay. So on July 12th, 1994, the two boys leave the house around 8 p.m. in the family car. So they have the Rafay family car. They go to several places throughout the night, which police can confirm easily. They start off at a restaurant. Then they go to a movie theater. They see The Lion King, which um, had a start time of 9.40 p.m. After that, they go to Seattle for, like, milkshakes and fries. While they're there, they ask a waitress if there's a good nightclub around. Mm -hmm. Um, So they're in Seattle. Of course, there's a nightclub. Yeah. When the uh, boys show up at the club, though, they're turned away. So around 2 a.m., they return home, and they walk in to find, like, a horrifically bloody scene. Mm -hmm. So the mom is found being to death in the garage. Her head is covered by a scarf, Mm -hmm. and she's positioned facing east. They find the dad up in the bedroom. He's also dead. Um, And due to his injuries, he's just, his head is gone. He's completely unrecognizable. Oh, shit. There is blood and teeth and tissue just everywhere in the room and in the hallways. Wow. It's, yeah, it's pretty disgusting. Um, and then, unfortunately, they don't open the door to the sister bedroom. Um, they kind of assume that the killer still might be there. So they go outside, they call 911, mm-hmm. and they wait for the police. They don't help his sister? Yeah. Or they don't even check on her? They don't check on her. Mm. Yeah. So police are a little suspicious when they show up at how the boys are acting. Um, They claim that Atif is more concerned with, like, possible missing stereo equipment, a Walkman, and a VCR. Mm -hmm. And they also claim that they heard, the police are claiming that the boys told them in a statement they heard the sister moaning, but they didn't do anything to try to help her. Oh. Which just breaks my heart. Yeah. Um, she actually is alive when the police show up, but she does later die at the hospital oh. from her injuries. So while there, the boys give initial statements. They agree to surrender their clothing, their shoes, and other personal items to the police, as well as they submit um, to like a light source test mm-hmm. to see if there's any blood on their bodies okay so after being taken to the station they also submit to a gunshot residue test fingerprinting and mug shots a gsr test but nobody was shot uh well i'm gonna get to that but no okay no nobody was shot um so atif and sebastian state that during this whole time while they're you know with the police no grief counseling or legal counsel was offered to them mm-hmm. at any point by the Bellevue Police Department. 
Um, it's also really unclear if any of their family or friends have been contacted to come be with them. Mm-hmm. And keep in mind, they're 18. So, yes, legally adult, but 18. Yeah. Um, so naturally, they can't stay at the buffet home. Uh, so police arrange for them to be placed at a motel in two separate rooms. And they're there over the next three days. And as far as the boys know, they are cooperating. They're not being detained. Um, mm-hmm. They're submitting to any questioning. They're giving written statements, video statements to investigators. And this takes place over the course of like 56 hours. Okay. Right. So on July 15th, um, apparently after Sebastian's mom m- involves the Canadian consulate, mm-hmm. it's decided that the boys can return to Canada. They hop on a bus and go to Sebastian's home. Okay. While watching the evening news, they learned that that day there was a family funeral that took place. Oh, for his family? For Atif's family. Okay. So all three had a funeral and they were buried up in uh, Snohomish. Okay. So according to Rafay, to Atif, he has no knowledge that that was going to happen. And he's kind of outraged a little bit Mm -hmm. when he said he contacted uh, the detective in charge of the case in Bellevue. He says he got he got no response. Um, So in the docuseries, the detective maintains that as a member of the Muslim faith, Mm -hmm. Atif should have known that this was going to happen. And that's just due to the nature of a Muslim funeral. Yeah. It needs to happen within 24 hours of the person dying. Mm-hmm. Uh, unless there's uh, circumstances where, you know, it might be a crime. But then it still should be as soon as possible. So furthermore, the Bellevue police claim the boys should not have left the country and that they were not informed that they would be leaving the country. What? Right. So still... Although police might be leaning towards Atif and Sebastian as suspects, at that point, they are still not named and no charges are filed. Okay. Right. So let's get into the evidence. All right. Atif and Sebastian have confirmed alibis that evening. I mean, the police can confirm it. However, the investigators believe that they were strategically calling attention to themselves at every place that they went to build an alibi. Oh, okay. Right. So they use all of this to prove like reasonable suspicion. Mm-hmm. Um, so some interesting things that stick out first of all, <laughs> they went to go see The Lion King, which is a Disney movie. Yeah. They're 18. I Kind of odd. Well, maybe they're choir kids. I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe they like theater. I just don't know. I, don't know. I mean, they, they might have. I'm not. I mean, The Lion King's a, an awesome movie. Yeah. I, it is. But 18 year old boys, I don't know. I think it's a little odd too. So, police kind of call attention to that. Okay. Um, so, while they're there after the movie started, so remember it had a call time or a call time, it had a show time of 9 40. Mm-hmm. They complained not too long after the movie starts that there's something like a curtain or a screen malfunction. Yeah. But after about 10 p.m., none of the employees there and no people in the theater remember seeing them. So they don't see them leave, essentially. They don't see them during the movie. They don't see them leave. Um, So after that, then they went to a restaurant in Seattle where they gave like an absurdly large tip just for milkshakes and a snack. Okay. So while they're there, they make it a point to ask where a good nightclub would be in Seattle and when they get to the club, it's clear they were from out of town due to their IDs. They showed their Canadian IDs. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to physical evidence, there isn't much. So there's a pubic hair found on the sheets of the bed where Dr. Buffet was murdered. Uh-huh. It's actually not a match to anybody, the family or the two suspects. Um, in the downstairs bathroom, they find Dr. Buffet's blood in the shower, along with unknown DNA. And Sebastian's hair. They also find a bloody footprint in the garage that can't be matched to anybody. And then lastly, they find blood along the bottom rim of one of Atif's pant legs. 